starting immediately to Mr. Lambert's uh, left is Jeff Bialos. Uh, he is here because he had the same job that Brett has uh, in the uh, uh, administration twice removed, the Clinton administration. Um, to Jeff's left is Byron Callen, who here represents Wall Street here today. And, uh, and it is noteworthy. Um, yes. and, and, and has not yet been arrested. <laughs> oh, it's only, only in its... <laughs> yes. it, it is useful to note that uh, there has not been a QDR before that even had the phrase access to capital in its text. And so there's a sea change uh, just in the recognition of that dynamic as important to defense and to the industrial base. Um, to Byron's left is Alan Javotkin. Alan is here because, in fact, half of our industrial base now, half of the money that DOD spends under contract is with services rather than for uh, platforms and systems and research and technology. And a recognition of that, I think, is, uh, is something that uh, is important for us to focus on today and to look at the QDR through that prism and lens. So Mr. Chavotkin is here representing that side of the equation. And then finally, uh, Bill Greenwald, who was also a previous deputy undersecretary for industrial policy in the Bush administration. So we've got a group here who can provide uh, a variety of perspectives on, uh, on this QDR itself and on what it says and on what it doesn't say. Um, I'll ask that they'll each uh, provide some remarks. You hold your questions. When the four of them have finished, we'll open the floor for questions. But I am reserving the first question uh, for Brett Lambert, who has graciously agreed to stay through the panel session as well. So you get to think about what you're going to ask these guys as, uh, as they're going through their process. <laughs> That's right. So with that, uh, uh, Jeff, you've got the floor. Ah, helps to turn it on. Uh, being here with John Hamry uh, made me think about the changing errors, if you will, that we face. And uh, we've been in a bull market in defense the last uh, seven, eight years here uh, after 9-11. And it does look like we're at something of a crossroads. And I think John's, what John touched on is, uh, you know, are we back to the late 90s in a period when he gave a speech of bemoaning the fact that the capital value of major defense contractors was less than Martha Stewart uh, and her enterprise. Uh, and the question is, will, w w as budgets flatten in the, inevitably in the next period, uh, is our industry able to weather the storm? And I would submit, I didn't come here to have this discussion per se, but I would submit our companies are better equipped today to weather a flattening of demand and maybe even some declination than they were a decade ago. But it, it points out the need for vigilance. Um, in an era when we're going to see potentially some flattening and declination of demand, uh, you know, and you're apt to see uh, concerns about the industrial base. And, and I think John's point was we have to watch out for the fragilities in this era. But um, to put all this in context, we're here to talk about this in the context of the QDR. And uh, let me make a few general comments and then talk about the defense industry. Um, First of all, this QDR, it's evolutionary, not revolutionary, and that's to be expected. We have a Secretary of Defense in his third year in office, and this QDR is entirely consistent with, by the way, and quite good, I think, but entirely consistent with his speeches, actions, and budget decisions over particularly the last year and a half, uh, but really his whole tenure of office. It would be shocking at this point if it was a radical departure. Uh, and I think that's good because I think continuity is good, but in that continuity is change because he's effectively said, let's shift the focus, let's shift the balance somewhat toward the wars we're fighting, and this particularly pertains to the acquisition community and the comment that Brett made that, you know, the Defense Department is a war and at and isn't. Uh, let's shift the balance toward the wars we're fighting. Uh, and I think that's done that in, in every which way. And it's very hard to disagree, therefore, with the vectors in this uh, QDR. A few other just general points of things I think that are noteworthy that are not covered in this QDR that relate in general ways to the industry. One is force structure. Uh, you know, if you're going to shift the balance 
one thing to think about is making adjustments to the force structure. Uh, you know, we, we have an army under stress. We have an army that has shifted its focus toward the continuum of low intensity conflicts there fighting, but there, there are really two questions going forward, which is, one, uh, is the Army really institutionalizing this change away from the concept of fighting the big one to essentially becoming, in some respects, a large special operations force? Uh, and, and two, can we shift the force structure, the active Army force and the reserve, in a way that takes the stresses off? And I think these issues were not addressed in the QDR, but I, my impression is they're going to be addressed going forward. I would just say it's hard to restructure the force when it's at war, frankly. Um, but I think it is an important issue if you go forward. Second, which again relates to the industry, little discussion of interoperability among for coalition forces, particularly uh, Europeans. Lots of discussion in the QDR about partnership, uh, which is important. Um, but I think there's not that much focus on, on less focus on Europe and the role of Europe in our uh, uh, defense. Uh, in part, that's probably in deference to the fact that the NATO strategic concept has not come out yet. Um, but I would say there are, there are two points uh, here. One, if you look at who it is we fight with in expeditionary warfare, uh, who goes to war with us, uh, it's our European brethren. And my own view is we need to do much more things now, a more robust agenda to maintain interoperability. Uh, with that force, and, and that would help promote transatlantic integration if we did that in the defense sector. Uh, two, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, and so we need greater interoperability among forces likely to continue to be at different levels of capability for years to come. Two, the reality is Europe has largely become debellicized, and other than two countries, the French and the UK, most of Europe is focused on Petersburg tasks and low intensity warfare. And we need to encourage that because we need to have that burden shared. And all of this points towards some degree of more cooperative defense programs with Europeans and more efforts to ensure that we can uh, work with them in a net centric environment. And I think those, to me, should be priorities. And I would hope that as we go forward, while not mentioned in the QDR, they become greater priorities. I was heartened to see a mention of the EU in the QDR. And I didn't go back and look, but my guess is this is the first QDR that mentions the European Union. And it reflects the fact that the EU is taking on a more prominent role in defense, particularly in this low intensity side of the equation, and has just put a package of directives out there to regulate the defense market and to open its internal defense market. And one point I think that's not quite mentioned in the QDR, but I think is an important point is I believe the Defense Department needs to engage much more deeply with the European Union on a range of issues from regulating the defense market to civil military cooperation. We just finished a study at Johns Hopkins called Fortresses and Icebergs, and that was one of the key findings in that study. Um, I think there has been forward movement in the Pentagon on this, uh, where to the point where you know you hear people on the policy side of the House saying we're open to engaging with the EU. But I think we have to move beyond that and develop a robust agenda with our our, our most important partner uh, in these uh, areas. Now. Let me turn now to the defense industry. As I said, as I kind of jokingly said, there is not much in uh, the QDR specifically on the defense industry, but what there I think is quite good, and I think Brett has laid out a very good vision uh, in, in this area. I think uh, the QDR is properly focused on both the demand and the supply side of the equation, uh, if you will, and the question is, uh, what are the acquisition system deficiencies on the demand side, and what do we do, and this is really the question, to ensure we have the defense industrial capabilities that are robust and competitive source defense industrial capabilities to meet our national security needs uh, 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 for the future. Uh, and particularly, as I said at the outset, how do we do this in an era of the potentially declining demand? We're back to that era, potentially, where it's flattening and potentially declining. And how do we make sure that we address the fragilities of the industry, in effect, as they happen? On the demand side, the QDR, I think, asked the right question, which is how do we uh, institutionalize the rapid wartime acquisition capability? You know, there's been really, for many years, two acquisition systems at the Pentagon. There's the, 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 the long-term one we all know with large programs that start with requirements. And that's the bulk, been the bulk of the spending. The second is one that wasn't all that big until after 9-11, and we started fighting these wars, and now has become much larger. And that's a short-term acquisition 
system driven by the needs in the field of a combatant commander. And it's sprung up in the Pentagon a series of ad hoc committees, ad hoc approaches, and lots of money. You bring it to Aberdeen and test it, and if it's good, we'll use it, is one extreme. And things like MRAP grew out of that. They didn't grow out of that long-term system. And the question is really, the, the QDA asked the right question, it doesn't really give a solution to this, is should we do something to institutionalize a, uh, this kind of a, a, a wartime system? Do we reform the big system, or do we do something to give us the standing, if you will, authorities and monies to better organize our effort for this sort of more short-term exigency-based system? And I think that's a fundamental challenge going forward, not addressed, and uh, you know, I think that's a challenge for this group, Brett and his colleagues in the Pentagon. Um, on the supply side, again, I think the QDR does suggest, it hints at a more robust not robust, a more uh, interventionist tilt, if you will, in terms of industrial policy. We've always had industrial policy at the Pentagon, but it tends to be ad hoc and uh, program specific. And I think what Brett has sort of suggested and the QDR hints at is uh, creating a more coherent, holistic approach to industrial policy uh, uh, across the board. Uh, a few comments on the framework for this. Fundamentally, uh, su demand drives supply. Uh, that is to say, you know, you're not going to buy things largely because of industrial needs. You're going to buy things because we have national security needs uh, uh, for those things. But that said, supply has to inform demand, and the capabilities the industry can offer get taken into account in shaping uh, defense demand. I think within that framework, there were a number of steps and tools that have to be taken, and some of the tools have fallen into abeyance. I don't think there's any magic to these tools. Uh, monitor and assess the supplier base, particularly relative to the uh, priorities set forth in the QDR. Uh, take industrial capabilities into account in shaping acquisition strategies. When we work on the demand side in the Pentagon, uh, taking the defense industrial capabilities into account. Uh, considering foreign sources of supply, establishing some sensible organizational conflict of interest rules, uh, uh, adding commercial suppliers, making it more sensible for commercial suppliers to play, uh, merger reviews, maybe we need some guidance here as we go into this new era, and uh, some ensuring better stewardship by, a good stewardship by primes of the uh, defense supplier base. I'm not going to talk about all those, but I want to touch on a few. Look, on monitoring the supplier base, that's what Brett's office and Brett are, are about, uh, and that's the historic responsibility. What you need to do here is matrix demand and supply. The QDR lays out a bunch of priority areas, and what uh, I would urge them to do is to go sector by sector and look at each of these sectors. The, the issue here is resources. Poor Brett's office has atrophied over, atrophied over the years, I don't think necessarily by intent, and he just today doesn't have the resources to do this. So I would ask the Pentagon leadership to give Brett more resources uh, to bring to the task so the ambition in the QDR can be realized, because without more resources, he can't do much more uh, than react. Uh, and, and so that's point one. The second point, so and they need I to think do... You should stop there. I think that was a good point. <laughs> Uh, shaping acquisition strategies. We began to do this in the late 90s and it really fell into abeyance. When we look at the demand side in the Pentagon, we need to look at industrial capabilities and bring it into play. Now again, that doesn't mean we decide on, on so we make source selection decisions on the basis of, you know, we need this industrial capability, therefore we're going to do it that way. It does mean as we shape long-term acquisition strategies in a capability area like radar or whatnot, we need to look at industrial capabilities as part of that equation. And I would favor a more holistic look in capability sectors at, let's say, sectors like radar, like UAVs, and where you look at, you bring together the requirements, the budget, the acquisition, and the user community, and, and you essentially do a set of trade-offs uh, in, in, in a holistic and coherent way. And that's not really done today, and I think that's the way to bring industrial capabilities into account. And if you begin to shape acquisition strategies that way, you can do things like um, address supplier base issues. You can say, aha, uh -huh, let's have some competition at the subsystem level in program A and B and C. We can eliminate some program redundancy if we do that too. Um, foreign sources of supply, the QDR mentions foreign sources of supply. 
I think we need to look at our defense industrial base in an expanded way, and indeed we have in a practice in the last uh, eight years. As the study we did showed, foreigners have gotten a good portion of the uptick and the bull market, and most of the major foreign firms today have secure facilities here, a ticket to the dance, uh, and I think we need to take more steps to encourage more globalization uh, with our industrial partners in support of that. And my second to last point is on export controls, which is segues, this, this issue of globalization segues into. I was heartened to see in the QDR and in the President's State of the Union the focus on export controls, uh, which is the key impediment to this kind of globalization and collaboration with allies. I just came back from a trip to the UK where senior acquisition officials there are now talking about ITAR free programs. When His Majesty's government, our closest allies, starts talking about ITAR free and programs, we need to listen. ITAR is not the root of all evil, to be sure, and we need export controls, uh, uh, but we need to listen. Um, OCI is an important issue going forward, and I know the rules are coming out. It is not directly mentioned in the QDR, but I think having organizational conflict of interest rules in implementation of the Weapons Acquisition Reform Act is a critical issue for the industry going forward. Um, and I think there's some things that need to be done here, and I, I do worry here that we, we need to set a rules that provide greater certainty to industry. Um, we need to carve out the most sensitive tasks from these omnibus contracts on the demand side and lay out a policy that says, that, well, we can, it's good to have omnibus contracts on the support side. Those omnibus contracts should carve out the source selection, and test, and eval activities that are creating these conflict situations. Uh, I think we need some merger guidance here on what happens when you have a company with a lot of support services buying a company with products in the same field. And I believe that we really need to look for some guidance here to say that we're going to have structural solutions in those kinds of mergers. Firewalls don't work. Finally, I think we need a set of regs that create some safe harbors. Um, I don't think it makes any more sense to give all the discretion to say the program managers to carve solutions out to OCI when the solutions affect the structure of the industry. Uh, I think we have to create some broad uh, safe harbors and clear rules. For example, if the answer is that a separate subsidiary will cure and mitigate some OCIs, I think we need to lay that out explicitly and not leave the parameters of that to, you know, a program officer. If collaborative activities between company A and B are going to give rise to OCIs in an industry where teaming is the norm, I think we ought to not leave that to a program officer to do. Finally, on the, uh, the merger uh, review, uh, as we get into this era again here of, uh, you know, uh, uh, flattened demand, you're apt to see more consolidation. And I do think, again, we're going to look to some guidance here on a couple of points. One is I would like to see some guidance on uh, distinguishing innovation markets from legacy markets. I think we probably would be, should be more willing to accept consolidation in the legacy area than in markets like a UAV market where innovation is so critical. Two, I think we have to think about the role of private equity. Uh, and will, what, what is the feeling in the Pentagon and the role of private equity as a steward of a sector where we really would prefer stewardship with a long-term vision uh, in mind? And so let me close on that, but I think the question is, uh, Brett needs the resources, and can the Pentagon give him the resources to take the set of tools I just outlined and, and use that to implement the vision he articulated? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, now we'll turn to, uh, to an exploration of what is perhaps one of the most complex dialogue arenas in Western civilization, and that is the dialogue between Wall Street and Washington. And uh, for insight on uh, that and the industrial base views of, uh, of uh, QDR, I'll turn to Byron Callen. Byron. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Thanks, uh, everybody, for coming here this morning. Um, I want to try and keep my thoughts fairly brief um, and, you know, start out with the financial markets perspective. I guess the first thought is, just as the QDR talked about a, a nuanced defense industrial base, the financial markets are obviously very nuanced as well. Uh, we tend to think of, of Wall Street um, as, you know, maybe akin to the very large defense contractors, but uh, the financial community is also very nuanced. It's not just the large. Um, sell side research analysts that are quoted in the newspapers. It's a whole range of institutional investors, both here in the United States and frankly globally. Um, 
uh, uh, Jeff just mentioned the uh, the private equity community. They're they're an, a, have been a very important player, and I think will continue to be a very important player in in um, shaping the industry. Uh, venture capital um, is important at, at uh, sowing the seeds for the the young emerging companies, and uh, clearly commercial banks that provide credit lines and assist in, in the merger and acquisition activity are, are part of this broader financial community too. So. Um, I'd, I'd expand that notion. It's not just Wall Street, it's the financial markets in general. Um, I do think, uh, you know, it was very significant that the QDR chose to acknowledge not just the defense industrial base in approximately two pages, but that paragraph about <clears throat> the, the um, acknowledging the role of the financial community in, in basically maintaining and shaping the industrial base was unique. Um, it's not just the United States. It's, it's something I haven't seen in the white papers that have come out of Australia or the, the, the French white paper uh, last year, the, the UK papers, a green paper yesterday, and I think there was one, an, an acquisition paper that just came out. So um, the capital markets have been a key uh, strength in, in shaping this industrial base, and I think that, that role and that acknowledgement is, is very significant going forward. Um, you know, my perspective right now that the large public companies are in fairly good shape financially, um, but the small, the mid-sized companies are going to continue to tap um, uh, capital for, for their growth needs and uh, for, the, for consolidation, I think, is going to continue. There will be restructuring of the, of the industry going forward. And really, you know, kind of across the spectrum for the publicly traded companies at least, um, equity is going to be an important uh, component to retain and, and uh, att attract people and provide stable career paths. Um, um, I know Boeing, for example, recently did uh, an equity uh, contribution in their pension plan that provided security for their, their people going forward. So um, this isn't just about, about um, uh, the mergers and acquisitions or divestitures. It's also about um, a, a component of compensation that the defense industry has to compete against the private, uh, private companies or public companies outside of defense as well that I think is, is important. Um, there was a lot in the industrial part of the QDR about dialogue and transparency, and I think, you know, um, this administration has really gotten off on a, on a good, good start. Um, Brett mentioned the, the meeting uh, recently with, with Wall Street analysts, but um, I think that's extended to CEOs and industry as well, too. Um, I, I think those are important means. They're not obviously ends in their self. Um, you know, from my perspective, the most important issue for the financial markets is going to continue to be risk and return. Um, I, I think the, the nature of this piece is that risk is just going to be inherent in, in the defense industry as it is in other, other sectors. Um, investors inevitably are going to want uh, stability and predictability, but the future is apt to be unstable and unpredictable. Um, nothing, nothing really unique or insightful in that comment, but um, there's always going to be that tension. Um, this dialogue and, and openness and transparency, I think, can help that. Um, but even other parts of the QDR suggested that there's going to be continued uncertainty and opportunity and things like um, the, the aircraft modernization programs, um, you know, what happens to, uh, to spare parts demand as you flush out uh, older, older generation aircraft. Th those are parts that the financial community is just going to have to work through. Um, there was language about fixed price contracts and the alignment of profitability with performance. So um, those issues are going to continue to weigh on, on how investors look at the sector. I think in the past, um, where, where capital has really been spooked by what's happened um, in, in the defense sector has really come from these um, um, big surprises, sudden surprises, abrupt changes. The, um, the PBD 753 uh, decision in, in 2004 where we saw a number of programs canceled abruptly, uh, the F-22, C-130, um, that uh, came as a, a surprise and I think really caused people to pull back from this sector. Um, the other obvious um, uh, era or, or periods of era where, where um, investors have shied away from the sector have been where risk has um, overwhelmed a particular company, um, Lockheed in the early 1970s with the C-5 program or McDonnell Douglas with the C-17 program in, 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 uh, in 1990. So I think 
this dialogue and transparency that was addressed in the industrial base, um, I think it's very important that, that a good part of that is going to acknowledge the risk and returns that uh, um, are expected on both sides of the fence. Finally, um, you know, the, the QDR can't uh, encompass all the issues. Uh, we could have a thousand page document, I think, pretty quickly, and, and uh, maybe two or three hundred pages on the industrial base. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there were some things that were kind of left hanging, and maybe these will come up in the Q&A uh, discussion um, about, about the QDR and the industrial base. I think um, Brett mentioned the comment about sunset industries and poor business models. Um, I don't really know at this point what is a sunset industry. I, I've got my own ideas, but uh, we could argue uh, 10 or 15 years ago that maybe uh, track and wheeled vehicles might be something of a sunset industry, and yet uh, a program like MPRAP has, has proven how important those, those shifts and changes could be. Um, I, there was a comment in the back of the room about Willow Run, and um, it, it's just a reminder that uh, it's not just the defense industry, it's the broader economy and, and the skills and capabilities that the broader economy brings to the defense, uh, to the national security of the United States. So thinking of this about um, how do we um, sustain a, a qualitative advantage in, in defense when other companies have access to technology and, and lower cost manufacturing um, skills, I think is, is going to be very critical going forward and something that uh, we could write a book on easily. Those are my remarks. Thank you, Byron. Thank you very much. Um, we'll turn now to the services side of the equation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Defense now spends about as much money under contract with services as it does in procurement and research and development. Uh, that's a side. Actually, to call it an industrial base sort of implies a, a, a level of, uh, of imprecision in the term. Uh, but as some of you know, we here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies have for a number of years spent a good bit of analytical time on what we call the professional services industrial base, that is, those industries and companies uh, and workers who do provide those services to national security. And, uh, and so now we'll turn to Alan Chavotkin for his reflections and views. Alan? David, thank you, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, the Professional Services Council is a national trade association. We represent over 340 companies, all of whom sell professional and technical services to the federal government. So we naturally focus on uh, the way the Defense Department buys uh, goods and services generally and uh, services in particular. And I was struck by the QDR because it starts with a description of some changing department missions. And of course, in our perspective, the industrial base uh, exists to support the department's missions. And the recognition of this evolving um, change in, in missions is important because uh, the industrial base has to exist to support that. Uh, the QDR talked, uh, interestingly, about uh, a whole of government approach, uh, reiterating some of the Secretary's views on the, and support of the President's views of a 3D strategy of defense diplomacy and development. Uh, but then went on to raise some concerns about the quality of the interagency coordination. And so I think we've got some goals set out, uh, yet some challenges ahead. Uh, it talks about the importance in the industrial base of a, of a total defense force, which recognizes the contributions that the active military and guard and reserve uh, can make, along with the defense civilian employees and the contractor community and the contributions uh, that each of those make, uh, yet it proposes to reduce the, the amount of support contractors uh, working for the Defense Department. So I, I think there's some questions about uh, priorities and, and signals. Uh, it, it recognizes that the industrial base is not monolithic. In fact, I'd submit that it's not even very well organized. And uh, so uh, as, as we look at uh, differentiating among the many suppliers, I think it's important that we, at some point, and this QDR isn't a place to do that, otherwise it would be 10,000 pages, not simply 1,000 or 160, uh, but to look at the, the contributions and the role of uh, domestic versus foreign. Um, almost no mention of uh, small business, and but the role of the small, mid-tier, and large firms uh, that we're looking at. The, the differentiation between platform companies and integrators uh, and services providers. Uh, Brett touched on the importance between uh, prime contractors and subcontractors, particularly those who are critical technology providers. Uh, and we'll, uh, Byron already talked about the role of financial institutions. 
secondly, there was a, a discussion of the workforce, uh, although not a very elaborate discussion of the workforce. Repetition, it seemed, of some of the clear departmental policies already in place uh, to grow the size of the federal workforce and the Defense Department workforce in particular. And that's a goal that we support. I mean, it's unquestionably that, unquestionable that the Defense Department's workforce has atrophied not only in the critical areas of acquisition policy, but in some of those technical skills as well. And, and it's important to approach, uh, to regrow some of that. Uh, but it has to be done strategically. And I think the guidance that the Deputy Secretary of Defense has issued, uh, some of the statements that uh, uh, Under Secretary Carter has made and the Office of Management and Budget have discussed, uh, focuses on that strategic nature, uh, identifying the key skills and, and how to accomplish uh, growing the workforce in a strategic manner. Uh, unfortunately, what we've seen so far is uh, growth that is opportunistic rather than strategic. Uh, and some of the insourcing, and uh, I could take the rest of the time to talk just about insourcing, but I won't. Uh, we see many, much of the insourcing activities taking place in the Defense Department today uh, being driven by the budget rather than by any overall strategy. And I think uh, to the extent that the workforce issues can be addressed uh, as, as part of a four-year strategy, uh, the Department has to come to um, recognition of how it wants to address the insourcing issues. Uh, and uh, baked into that budget are some uh, arbitrary savings from uh, this insourcing activity, and I think that needs uh, a little bit more inspection uh, as well. So if we've got a new strategy for uh, the department's missions and, and we look at an industrial base capability, uh, we have to look at how the government buys goods and services and what the acquisition system is and that links these two uh, to support the department's mission. And I think as Brent mentioned in his remarks in the QDR uh, properly notes, uh, one size can't fit all in the industrial base and nor can one size fit all in an acquisition system. Uh, the QDR talks about the importance of agility in, in the acquisition, uh, but there's little indication to me that there's going to be change at the core system. Uh, what I do see is uh, several references to developing ways to circumvent the current system, whether that's the creation of a contingency acquisition fund or rapid acquisition cells. Uh, these are really recognitions of the challenge at the core system and the importance of the agility and, and ways to, to make sure that the department can meet its mission. And if we have that at the, at the edges, we ought to consider doing so at the core as well. We need to look then uh, at the techniques uh, that are available. And uh, Byron mentioned uh, some of the uh, techniques available. I, I thought the QDR did a masterful job of acknowledging uh, some of the tech acquisition techniques uh, around fixed price development, uh, for example, but noted that that's to be used only where appropriate. Uh, and I think that's a signal to folks that uh, this is not the, the only policy to be available. Uh, and in fact, a, a recent report from the Defense Business Board uh, highlights the findings that uh, fixed price uh, contracting, particularly in terms of development, is uh, rarely appropriate. And I hope the department uh, in, in its acquisition techniques would take a look at that. And in a slightly unrelated context, Norm Augustine once said that uh, the area is uh, unblemished by success, and I think he could talk uh, specifically to uh, fixed price development as, uh, as that poster child. And finally, if we, if we understand that we have a workforce uh, available and an acquisition system that can uh, support how the department buys its goods and services and we're using the right techniques to do that, uh, then we have to look at a set of potentially conflicting uh, policies and priorities uh, that have been addressed. Uh, and Jeff mentioned some of them and Brett mentioned some of them. Uh, but we, I think the, department, the QDR doesn't really talk about how to balance some very significant uh, challenging priorities and policies uh, from competition to the role of organizational conflicts. Uh, how do we handle job retention and creation, particularly at the, at the technology level um, uh, with uh, issues about uh, Buy America, particularly in contingency contracting. So there's a whole list of, of policy issues that I think uh, are touched on uh, because of the strategies in the QDR, but 
uh, certainly not resolved. I think that gives uh, Brett and, and his colleagues in the department plenty of opportunity for more work. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that the partnership uh, will exist, uh, will bring us uh, lots of opportunity for dialogue. Uh, but these are just a few of my favorite things. Thank you, Alan, very much. Now our, our uh, final panel member, Bill Greenwald, uh, also served as the Deputy Undersecretary for Industrial Policy during the uh, second Bush administration, and uh, here to reflect on his views of the QDR, Bill. Thank you, Dave. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually kind of nice to go to go last because I can pretty much say yeah, well, everything they've said, and I've, they pretty much touched on mo most of the issues. But uh, um, the, uh, th this is, I think the QDR is, is extremely important for, for the first time, institutionalizing industrial base considerations in, 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 into the, uh, in, in the QDR, and I think that's something that uh, uh, a lot of outside observers and industry has been, been, been uh, hoping to see, and, and, and I think it's a very positive first step. Uh, I think we've heard the number of things that, that are in there, and, 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 and the QDR industrial base section is really asking the right questions. So I think I might take this just to, to the next step and say, well, how, how should that be implemented, and, 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 and what are the, the challenges to, to implementing it? And I think the, uh, the, the, the first uh, uh, issue to do is to gain visibility of the supply chain, and to do that, I think I have to key off on, uh, on uh, uh, Jeff Bialis's point, is you need the capability in the workforce to do that. And uh, since the reduction in the acquisition workforce over the last uh, uh, 20 years, industrial base an analysis has not been uh, 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 as, 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 is not as strong as it, as it used to be. And, and, and to build that up, it's, it's hopeful that the, of those 20,000 acquisition workforce positions that the secretary would like to get, Hopefully, a few of those happen to be industrial-based analysts, and and who can really cut across and look at look at the uh, uh, the, 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 the the industry. Uh, Brett has some tremendous uh, staff and some tremendous cap capabilities there, but they need to clone them, and, uh, and you know, and, and 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 they're so good that even David's hired one of them. So I mean, it's. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not, that's a good question. That's a good question. We have to, we have to look into that. Uh, so, so I think the workforce is going to be key, and therefore, but it's not just going to be the workforce that, that's hired. It's the get, getting into the PEO office and getting into the capability managers to have them start looking at what is it we need to cut across these programs and getting into uh, DDR&E and the S&T community to uh, look at and institutionalize yeah, these are the type of industrial base uh, and, and, and partners we're going to need in the next decade uh, uh, and, and beyond. Um, once, once you have a, uh, a visibility in, 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 into the supply chain and in, in, into what size you want, you really need a criteria for intervention if you're actually going to intervene. And, and uh, that, that is going to be uh, one that it's going to require uh, some a lot of thought and a lot of analysis, but you can break it up into um, uh, uh, various uh, uh, time frames. Like, what is it you're going to need to do rapid acquisition? In other words, what what do you need to support the NRAPs and the counter IDs and the ISR needs of the future? And how how is that industrial base uh, 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 looking? Looking into the midterm, kind of your your, your typical uh, MDAPs and 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 and, and small, smaller programs, and then out in into the future as far as future technology. Now I know your office uh, uh, started developing that type of criteria in the in in a number of studies uh, dealing with the S and T base going out in the future, and 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 that criteria may be a good one to start applying to the various segments. Uh, uh, what are those technologies, and what are those areas where we need to be uh, ahead of the world? What are those areas where we can partner with our uh, 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 European and, and other allied uh, industrial bases? And what are theirs that we're happy to be dependent upon the commercial, uh, commercial industrial base? And uh, that, so that's, that's getting that criteria for intervention, I think, is going to be a key. I think the third area uh, to be successful here is, is, is going to be funding. Uh, and there are a number of programs designed to how to uh, intervene in the industrial base and to support the industrial base, whether it's DPA, Title III money, or whether it's Mantech money. But the problems that, that 
one faces in these these uh, are are um, uh, more near term than that. In other words, you, faced with how do I intervene? I've got a supplier uh, that's going out of business. What 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 do we need to do here? And where do you get the money? Well, if it's, if it's within a program, probably the program is going to deal. But if this cuts across a multitude of programs, there's there's it's very difficult to get the the resources to actually uh, help to intervene there. And I think the Congress tried to set up what was called the Industrial Innovation Base and Innovation Fund to do that. And uh, the issue is whether uh, that is, is the, the appropriate mechanism or not. But something like that is, 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 is probably needed. Um, and then if you, the department is going to continue to, uh, to partner with the commercial uh, industrial base. Uh, it, 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 uh, an industrial-based policy needs to really look at the acquisition process and the acquisition system and the incentives and disincentives to non-traditional commercial contractors uh, main, continuing to be in the industrial base. And this is a long, long history. Uh, acquisition reform uh, of, of the mid-90s essentially tried to bring these these companies in I think was was very successful uh, some of that is 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 uh, that that consensus may be under threat at the current time so this is a good time to ensure that that those companies and that and those processes and those barriers are are uh, are maintained and then obviously there are a number of areas where there's still barriers to to bringing in uh, uh, non-traditional contractors which which could help uh, help help the base and obviously looking at whatever disincentives to future innovation again. So with that, uh, since, since Jeff pretty much did all, all the rest of my, uh, my topics, I will uh, key it over for questions. All right, thank you, Bill. Let me uh, uh, give you an administrative uh, announcement before we proceed into the questions. Um, at 10 o'clock, and it's right now about uh, nine minutes after 10, at 10 o'clock another event began uh, in here in the basement. It's on the other side of that back wall. The Philippine foreign minister is giving a talk. Um, so, um, you want us to go over? Uh, no, we're, we're, we're not going to go over, but uh, I want to alert you to that. Uh, I, I don't actually... Uh, uh, we won't take a poll on uh, on which one you'd rather attend, uh, but I, I do want to alert you to that because uh, there may be some. Uh, they've been asked to res be respectful of our uh, needs for uh, for noise uh, abatement, and we've been asked to do the same. And particularly when we wrap up and get ready to leave, uh, I'll ask you to to exit uh, uh, with the quietness of new fallen snow. Um, I, I am also here to tell you that it is not yet snowing, and so we're all still fine in that regard. Um, let me now uh, open up the floor to questions. Uh, we do have staff with microphones. I would ask you to raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Uh, you wait for the microphone, identify yourself and uh, your affiliation, and then you can direct your question to one, two, or all of the, uh, of the panel here. Um, let me start over here on the left, since I ignored the, uh, that side of the room. My left, your right, uh, during the first round of questions. Uh, here comes the mic. Uh, Bill Courtney with CSC. Uh, the Last Supper was referred to. How did the consolidation after the Last Supper work out on balance? Were there any lessons learned that would be helpful for what may lie ahead if there is flattening and perhaps decline in defense spending? Well, I mean, I... I don't think we, we truly know the answer to that. I, I think one of the, what I take away, and this is just a personal view, having been in the industry when it occurred, was that uh, it was necessary, it was, it was the right thing to do at the right time. Um, I think what we struggle with is, um, from, from a business point of view, it was largely a consolidation of stock symbols, not necessarily capacity. and. Uh, and we m perhaps overlooked as a department the need to promote um, uh, the consolidation at the capacity level. So we weren't working at 20 or 30 percent of a factory's uh, capacity and, and the taxpayer was, was paying that overhead rate. So I think, uh, again, I think, it, I, I think it was the right thing to do at the right time and I have tremendous respect for everyone who was involved in that process that they lived through it. Um, I think if, if there were to be uh, not another Last Supper, because I don't think that's going to happen, but maybe a first breakfast at some point, um, that 
we would we would try to think more about the business implications, uh, the financial implications, um, and, and what incentives uh, and disincentives uh, we would look to. I, I'd actually be interested in, in uh, uh, everyone's comment on that, particularly buyers, because I you know they they see this uh, in the financial community all the time, the the implications of, of that consolidation. So. I think you certainly created, uh, you know, maybe maybe Jeff mentioned it, and I, I alluded to. It. I think for a number of the companies, the large companies that were at the forefront of the consolidation, you've got a, a much more financially stable industry right now. Uh, the large companies, some have more cash in their balance sheets than they do debt right now. <clears throat> so, you know, with whatever comes out of the budget right. in the next couple of years, I, I just don't think companies should be able to, to work through this without. Uh, the kind of perils of Pauline drama we've seen in the past of Lockheed I alluded to in the early 70s or McDonnell Douglas in, in the 90s. Um, so I think from a financial perspective, that's probably been <clears throat> the most uh, significant change. If I could just add, one of the other uh, implications is the way the department approached the marketplace. Uh, so the growth of large IDIQ contracts, large in, uh, multiple award contracts, uh, the growing the size of the procurements, uh, in part as a result of the shrinking of the acquisition workforce. Those two factors, I think, both have to be addressed, one on the industrial side and one on how the department goes to market. And uh, thus, over time, uh, we've lost some of the agility uh, and flexibility that the department has I think both uh, from a capability standpoint as well as a contracting standpoint, uh, we're now seeing the results of that consolidation as new markets are, and new requirements are emerging and uh, sort of compromising a little bit on the flexibilities. I mean, as I alluded to at the outset, I think there are some lessons learned from it. Uh, one is, uh, I think as we go into, if and as we go into a declination period and, and, and a consolidation period, we need to be more vigilant about the effect on the industrial base. The fragilities that emerged in the last cycle, uh, the, the debt on Raytheon and Lockheed, were sort of known but really only uh, became a focus late in the game. And I think there needs to be, this goes back to the monitoring point, more monitoring of this. I will say it was an inevitability. and. The question you have to ask yourself, do we have a sufficient number of robust competitors in the core sectors in the industry? And I think we kind of came out of it. And the answer, you know, special exceptions, the answer is by and large, yes. We had as much competition as we can afford in the major sectors. All right. Uh, other questions? I'm, I'm having trouble seeing hands because actually the lights are more bright than your faces. Uh, so uh, I think there's one in the back, and then we'll come over here. So, uh, yes. Hello, uh, my name is Raj Sharma from the Fair Institute, and um, my question is pertaining to some of the issues addressed around um, bringing in uh, really third and fourth tier suppliers or attracting new suppliers that are capable of addressing uh, some of the. Um, emerging needs, uh, suppliers that are really bringing new and emerging technologies. And could you speak to a little bit about, uh, we've written a paper around some of the barriers to entry in the, in the federal market from a defense uh, market uh, specifically, defense sector specifically. What do you see as really key barriers to entry and key barriers to attracting those types of companies that are developing new and emerging technologies? Uh, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd start by saying having spent my previous career working with many of those companies, you might want to switch your question to what isn't a barrier uh, to, uh, to entry into the federal marketplace. And, and this is why I think the QDR was a, hopefully effective in at least illustrating our commitment to begin to understand the complexities of, of that issue, because it, 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 everyone up here has a different take on it. There's a financial take. Can they get access to capital? Uh, Byron alluded to the fact that many of our primes have two-year backlogs, at least. Uh, our second and third tier uh, may have six months, uh, some 12 months. Uh, the uh, restriction to access for capital for them and the procurement process we have and how we pay them and how they can get paid from the primes has a tremendous effect on their capacity for both innovation and growth. And we have not, I think, adequately addressed the complexity of that, that issue. 
there will always be barriers. We're, we can't rewrite uh, uh, all the DFARs that would need to be written. It's just not going to happen. And that's why I go back to that we have to rule with reason. We have to do what's practical and what's in the best interest of the taxpayer and the warfighter. One of the vehicles that I think has been quite effective uh, is this rapid uh, rapid acquisition process. And, and to the points that were made earlier, there's always a danger of that process. And in fact, I've seen it uh, with one program where I was looking at something got into a, a rapid acquisition process with an IOC, I think, of 2018. And uh, so, you know, a, as the system adjusts, uh, you know, the system, uh, uh, the, the building will adjust. So that's always a, always a danger. But um, but I think it, I, I, it's, a, it's a serious uh, question on a whole bunch of different levels is how we promote this innovation. And I think what's exacerbated, and at least in my concern, what's exacerba exacerbated the issue is the collapse of access to capital. And I see this uh, quite often in the, in the smaller firms. And it's not just the firms that are trying to offer innovative solutions for rapid deployment. It's the second and third tiers providing to programs of record that can't get access to capital, uh, that's forcing the primes uh, to actually make investments that are, in fact, unnatural acts. Uh, and uh, so I don't have an answer to that question. I think we don't understand uh, the intricacies of that question well enough yet. Uh, let me add two, two seconds. Just historically, uh, the, the concerns have always been around uh, uh, by commercial firms, intellectual property r rights, Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, issue of what to do with the technology, whether it can be uh, what, what the <coughs> export control process is going to deal with, and general unique uh, acquisition uh, uh, rules and regulations and, and auditing and financial right. burdens that they have to, to place. And, and historically, there have been a number of ways to, to allow those companies to, to participate, whether it's commercial item <coughs> exemptions or other transaction contracting authorities. And the issue... It, I think in today's environment is we, we, we can easily buy commercial off the shelf, but can we actually get t uh, modifications to those and, 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 and what are those, what those rules ha having to impact? So I, I think it's, we're kind of in that transition, but it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a number of issues that historically uh, the Congress and the administration have been trying to, to address to, make, to bring access to these non-traditionals. So we'll go from there. And it, it's probably worth noting that uh, that's an issue that you never actually get to the end of and say, okay, we got that one fixed, now now what? Uh, because it will constantly evolve in that way. I think I saw a hand up or a couple of hands up over here. Let me take the guy at the middle table there. We haven't had a middle table question yet on this side. Uh, Joe Listenden from ATK. Uh, in the context of the uh, insight before oversight uh, comment, as well as uh, some information that I've heard from Secretary Lynn um, this past fall, who was kind of framing the issue, which is uh, operating the railroad at the same time you're uh, laying the track. Um, and a lot of good ideas came out uh, here today uh, from the intertemporal nature uh, of looking at the uh, industrial base in addition to um, um, the intertemporal time uh, way to look at the industrial base. How do you um, intend, uh, Mr. Lambert, to uh, prioritize um, these great ideas that are here uh, and, and getting that insight at the same time that, uh, you know, some congressional uh, decisions are pending and industries are changing and forming, uh, reforming and restructuring very quickly at the same time, which will uh, ultimately impact uh, defense capabilities. Um, well, of course, I, I, I constantly and, and fervently agree with Secretary Lynn. Uh, <laughs> um, let's, let's make sure so, we get oh, that in. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, he has, I mean, I, I, I've known Secretary Lynn for some time. He has a unique uh, perspective, having been in both industry and the government. And I think uh, his insights, as well as uh, those of Dr. Carter, uh, and, and frankly, Secretary Gates, bring a, again, a kind of a new paradigm for understanding these industrial complexities. Uh, in terms of priority, uh, I have to say it is, it is, everyone said this when I came in, that you're, you know, you're going to be drinking with a fire hose. I, I had no uh, idea uh, what w the challenges uh, that the department faces across the services and across policy. Um, you know, we immediately set out to uh, understand 
items better. We've met with your CEO. We've met with most of the company's CEOs in here, and that's new. And what I can, we can't figure out, and I've had this discussion with Dr. Carter, we don't know why, when and why the department stopped having these meetings uh, and stopped gaining the insight and, 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 and creating the transparency and dialogue. Um, so we are, we're learning in real time, and I think that goes to Secretary Lynn's comments about trying to run a railroad while you're laying the tracks. In terms of priorities, um, I can only say that I'm, I'm, I've now learned uh, from Microsoft Office how you move tasks uh, to, uh, to 8 a.m. But it is difficult when you get calls uh, because our office, as all these folks up here know uh, and have had to deal, deal with, you know, we have, a, we have a reactionary portion, which is CFIUS and FOCI and where we're on clocks that are not of our own making. Uh, and so a lot of the priorities are, are not of our choosing. They're dictated to us uh, by law. And so our priorities literally shift um, daily in terms of the tactical priorities. What I'm trying to do, and I think what everyone has reinforced here, is that the Office of Industrial Policy should be thinking ahead. We should be thinking about not solving yesterday's mistakes, but trying to address tomorrow's problems. And I'm desperately trying to get our office oriented in that direction. We're not there yet, I have to be honest, and it's going to take us some time to get there. Let's see. Um, let's go to here and then up to the front here. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, Bill Edgar with IHS Jones. Uh, on the question around broadly around the partnership, this is probably more for the for the panel. No offense, Mr. Lambert, but <laughs> given that you're speaking Bill directly, Bill used to work. He used to work with me, so obviously. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then, and that I, I never want to set you up in that respect because it ever <laughs> ever comes back uh, uh, in that respect. But uh, around the partnership, I'd be interested in your thoughts around the impact, particularly as you look at uh, developments in the UK. Uh, on the on, on, on East uh, Pacific Rim Asia in terms of acquisition procurement um, policies, particularly on the public-private partnership model and the impact which ultimately comes down in the partnership with industry and the government's burden sharing, which is driven heavily by the investment environment in these areas. Um, is that uh, a role looking forward, particularly with the austerity in the economy, with the austerity around the budgeting right now? And looking at how do you balance then the investment for the two wars and still keep the long-term investment going uh, around strategy? And, and if so, or if not, rather, you know, how does that then affect the transatlantic relationships when the criteria for the, for the businesses in Europe that we want to integrate uh, are changing against the, the fiscal, of course, and, and the budgetary constraints that they're under? I'll try the first question, then maybe, Jeff, you can, you can go for the second. I don't know. Um, PFIs uh, and, and, and such and the partnerships that are, that are going on around there rely on a long-term contracting arrangement. And uh, now there are energy savings performance contracts in the U.S., which are 10 years long. Uh, they're, they're, they can go a little longer. And, and, and there are other, others, a few others like that. But... In the last few years, what we're seeing is, is the length of contracts actually going down. And so that's an, 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 you, so you're going to have a hard time getting industry to make the type of investments that they're making in, in the U.K. long term because they need to know what the return is going to be in five, ten years. And if you only have a three-year contract, you're going to have a hard time making having those type of partnerships. So in one sense, the, the acquisition system is kind of moving away from that here while, while our, our, our allies are, are looking for cost-saving ways to partner with industry and, and having a lot more longer-term contracts. So, but I don't know about as far as the, uh, the, the latter part, as far as how that mishmash is going to, going to occur. I think industry will kind of just, you know, adapt differently and while, while our, our partners overseas may have a, uh, a different pr perspective and ability to do that, the question is whether the Department of Defense will want to do that or not. And if they do, then obviously there might be some opportunities for them because they have experience with that. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot to add. I agree with what a lot of what Bill just said. I mean, uh, uh, I do think, um, you know, an unfortunate set of circumstances arose here over a period of time when uh, you, you know, the uh, other transaction authority here um, sort of withered on the vine, so to speak, under political pressure. And I think that's unfortunate. I think in the period that we're entering again here, you would like to see more creative use of 
that kind of authority. You would like to see models like leasing in some contexts, like PFI type models. Uh, I heard a laugh over here, but I mean, it's the, the the environment for it has just not been great. But it may be that as the numbers flatten, you know, uh, these types of things work. Um, I could give you one example. There is a program called NextView, I believe it's called. That's a good example of the kind of future we ought to think about in some of these areas. I mean, uh, this is a program that's designed by the defense agency that buys imagery data. And in, in, in the past, the idea would be let's build a satellite system. We'll build a satellite system for this kind of imagery data. But they did this a different way. Rather, they said we're going to let a long-term contract to buy imagery data. Here's the data we want. And we'll sign a long-term contract with the winner. And then the winner signed the contract and took the contract to the bank and got project finance and went and built its satellite system. You know, that's the kind of model you would like to see, particularly in areas where, uh, you know, there's some commercial uh, market going on and, and the companies can sort of value the service and figure out how to do this. Uh, and you get the government out of being a program manager, out of, out of building satellite systems, basically. Um, and and I, I do think it would be great to be able to see more creativity in this field. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, the political overlay has made this very hard. We're reaching the, the end of our time. I anticipated actually the time for another question, but, uh, but I didn't anticipate the time for the answers. Uh, and, uh, and I think actually that, no, it's not a slap because I actually think that was a very serious question and deserved a, a, a thorough answer, as did all of them. Clearly, we have only begun uh, to scratch the surface of the issues here this morning, and we could go on for another hour and a half and, and, uh, uh, and, and move forward. Uh, I want to do a couple of closing remarks. We do try to end these things on time because we recognize people have other commitments as well. Uh, but we're happy to stick around and, and take some questions uh, 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 after the uh, mics are turned off as, uh, and, and help you out in that regard. These are clearly critical questions that have been raised by everybody up here this morning. CSIS is going to continue to, to analyze and report on these and to hold events like these to sort of uh, further the public debate because this has been a neglected area uh, for many, many years here. What did we hear this morning? We heard Brett Lambert uh, describe DOD's commitment to doing a better job, uh, but we heard all of the panel describe ways in which they're going to need a lot of help in order to be able to execute on that commitment. Um, and I think that as we move forward collectively uh, across the government, it's going to take all of our efforts. Where do we go from here? The QDR actually cites a number of additional areas uh, in need of study, and uh, from space and anti-access to forces and manpower, and it's not clear what the impact of those studies will be. Uh, clearly, some programs and contracts are going to depend on the outcomes, uh, but we're not going to have them in time, so Congress will have to make its own budget decisions in a bit of a vacuum, and I think they are beginning to recognize that as a result of the hearings this week. Those of us uh, who analyze defense and, and national security uh, are still waiting in addition for the information that we usually get with the budget. So we can actually tell whether what the QDR says it did shows up in the budget and in the FIDIP. And uh, we'll see that hopefully over the next few days and weeks. And it will give us the details to really be able to provide a judgment here. And then finally, there is, as most of you know, a congressionally mandated panel to review this review. Uh, earlier this week, it was announced that that panel will be co-chaired by uh, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry and former National Security Advisor Steve Hadley. I would commend, and I think everyone here would commend, that that panel would, in fact, pay some attention to these industrial-based issues as it undertakes its review and reports out to the Congress uh, in late spring and early summer. So I think that uh, this is going to be an ongoing series of discussions. Uh, my final thing is I would like to ask you to join me in recognizing and acknowledging the, the CSIS staff who made this event possible this morning. I'd like them to please stand and let's give them a round of applause, uh, those of you who are in the room. So uh, before we go, I want to uh, remind you about the Philippine foreign minister next door. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you even more for your attention and support on these issues. Have a great snowy weekend.